Hello everyone, welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. This is part of my continuing series on the English Revolution, uh, and I'm joined today by a uh, imminent historian, the, I would say, legendary John Morrill. Can, can you be a legend? Is that all right? Uh, I suppose I can live with it. Has that been called worse? Uh, <laughs> well, John, I as I was telling you, this was not an episode I was planning on doing. I was doing this series, finding out a sort of, you could say, like a prehistory of of anarchism in the English Revolution and finding these interesting figures like um, the ranters and Gerard Winstanley, who, you know, it's a matter of historical contention whether we call anyone an anarchist prior to the 19th century, but whose ideas sort of rhymed with the ideas of Kropotkin, William Morris, Nietzsche, Oscar Wilde, that sort of thing. But as I was speaking to Ariel Hesseon and Rachel Foxley, who I believe were both your doctoral students, okay, Cromwell just kept coming up. I'm sorry, go go ahead, I cut you off. No, 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 no. All right, you well, carry Cro on. Okay, Cromwell just kept coming up as a as a inter a very interesting figure, a in a very broad sweep of history, we can make him a, you know, um, a strong man foil to our true radicals. Um, but in fact, in my conversations with Rachel and Ariel, that's not how he looked. He looked like a very interesting, compelling thinker and figure who was both ultimately sort of the, I don't know, de destroyer or curtailer of this radical milieu, and yet very much a part of this radical milieu, at least up until a certain point. And so I thought I would uh, throw these ideas at you and see see what you thought. Okay. Well, uh, you know, if you if you are by far the most important figure in coordinating a lot of very uh, people with varying degrees of reluctance to have a king put on trial and uh, convicted of treason against his people and then publicly executed <laughs> to me that's a radical figure <laughs> i mean okay. he, 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 if you believe that you uh, you're dedicated to overthrowing tyranny in all its forms whether it's tyranny in in um in the form of the executive whether it's tyranny by judges whether it's tyranny above all perhaps by churchmen if you want to liberate people uh, and and get them to accept the responsibilities of liberty, then then he's a radical. Um, on the other hand, if you continue to believe that that because there are so many people who um, are mystified and confused and being deluded by, you know, the system they've been living under and they're not capable of governing themselves, uh, then you become a top down you know governmental figure. So for me, the the modern parallels have always been the the creators of vanguard states in post colonial world. You know, you have to you have to. The aim is either either uh, gradually or not at all to enlighten the lumpen the lumpen majority into being um, accepting the responsibilities of freedom. Until that, that time, an elite will have to govern in, in your name, but more benignly than the tyrannies which you replay. So already we're talking about all the paradoxes. But nonetheless, I think if you start by saying that he not only believes in overthrowing um, or believing it's possible to execute kings for tyranny against their people, um, if you're saying he is radically committed to giving everybody who will um, live in peace with other people um, freedom, religious freedom, but you can't give religious freedom to people who, whose, whose job it is to stop other people having freedom, then that's a radical. And uh, To me, perhaps, although there are, there are quite a lot of thinkers in the early modern world who believe in religious liberty, He's one of the relatively few, relative, very few, who believes in religious equality. So religious liberty in the early modern period tends to mean uh, that you are allowed to worship freely, but you forfeit political rights to do so. Only membership of state religions can participate in politics. Um, and that remains the case really in England until the 19th century, except in the 1650s. 
But in the 1650s, if you remove all constraints on on um, people's um, religious on religious obligations, then people are free to participate in politics, even if they're not part of the state religion. That's radical for me. Um, you can take a, a, a much more uncomfortable position and say, is he a revolutionary figure? And you can say, well, like some of the things I've already said, to constitute a revolution, I mean, a revolution that says overthrows things which people had assumed couldn't be overthrown. I mean, I think one of the things about 1649 is that people were thinking impossible thoughts, thoughts that were unthinkable, you know, a decade previously were now being thought, and he is embracing those unthinkable thoughts and, and, and uh, acting on them. But, but modern revolutions tend to... Uh, emphasize things like the irreversible shift in the social distribution of wealth and power now there's no there's no radical redistribution of wealth and power in britain notice i use that word very advisedly because there is in ireland all right so in ireland nearly half the land is confiscated and is taken from a catholics born in ireland given to protestants um, of the first or second generation from england so that is an irreverse, uh, irreversible and unreversed until the 20th century shift in the distribution of wealth and power. Now, that's revolution, but it, it doesn't fit a Marxist model to say that if you if you overthrow you know, Irish Catholics and replace them by English Protestants, that can be a revolution, but it's not a proletarian revolution. So, if it's a, so one thing you do need to know about me from the beginning is that I think that what really constitutes the radicalism of the um, mid 17th century is the need to redefine the relationship between peoples rather than between classes. So that the driver for me of the all the violence mid 17th century is the redefinition of the relationship between Catholic Ireland and and varieties of Protestantism in Britain, and and the political institutions that you need to bring these peoples who've been um, at odds with one another for centuries to bring them into new relationships and the use of violence to achieve um, a temporary um, a, a, a largely temporary uh, reorganization of the relationship of peoples um, that's for me the revolution it's why you probably know that 30 years ago I was rather reluctant to call the events of the mid-17th century revolution. Though actually what I said, it wasn't, I, I think the words I actually used were, it was not so much the first of the great revolutions as the last of the wars of religion. So I didn't, I never entirely shut the door. I just thought, I just thought if, if you try to talk about what happened in the mid-17th century as being a precursor of what happens in France or in America for that matter, or in uh, Russia or China, then they, well, you're divorcing it from its early modern context, which is the, the era of Reformation. With, um, with, and Reformation, of course, is as much a social movement and a cultural movement as it is a religious movement. So I just wanted to get back to seeing the importance of religion. So there you are. There, there, there's a kind of a broad statement of, of a case which, uh, you know, you can, you can then start to challenge, you know, if you're a strict Marxist by saying, but, you know, you, you, I'm sort of just idiot not to realise that class is always the bottom of things, to which I say, well, I, I'm not an idiot, but you, you're, you're a very right think I am. But I, I do think, I do think that uh, actually empirically, it's, empirically it's very difficult to invalidate the, the claims I've just made. Um, so I have a, uh, this is, this is a wonderful opening statement. I'm going to have to make sure we, we go back and do some of the, the harder history because what, because my instinct, John, is just to leap off and just say lots of things in response to that. And I can't do that, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, I am not a, a, a pure Marxist in that sense. I find the claim that everything is always class is laughable. That's just laughable. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's not, you're not I, you don't look ser <laughs> you don't you don't see, look serious enough to be a heavyweight Marxist. <laughs> you're not carrying you're not carrying a much, much of, of the of the oppression in the world about you. Well, that's I mean that's the complaint uh, from the Marxists to the anarchists all the time is that we don't understand yeah. the thing, the stuff that really really matters and the the radical publisher Verso does publish some anarchists but it has a reputation for just thinking that the anarchists aren't aren't serious and thus are not worthy worthy of publication so um <laughs>
so the first thing to say, besides the fact that I am not a, a Marx, it's not to say that I don't like the work of Christopher Hill and Hobsbawm. I certainly do admire yeah. their work, and I dislike the sometimes single-minded Marxism of their work. Uh, with that said, there's just more continuity between the 17th century and the 19th century than we realize. I'm looking at continuities both ways. And I'm so I'm very skeptical of a radical rupture between somewhere between 1650 and 1789 for for multiple reasons. So that was a lot. So you can respond to any of that that you would like to, or we can move on and go to Cromwell, whichever you prefer. Well, just to set up an agenda, really, I think you have got to factor in Enlightenment ideas, the reaction against you know Reformation and and. So that's it. first of all, that is that, that there is a re real, a real problem of just thinking you read the nineteenth century reads the seventeenth century without reading it through Enlightenment eyes. Yeah. Uh, so a, I mean, there is, of course, a, a tremendous amount of emotional um, um, response in the nineteenth century to the writings of the seventeenth century, including the unquestionably radical writings. But there, but it, there are lots of ways in which they are. Well, is it fair to say this? Is, is does any age re properly read the product of the past? But palpable, palpable misreadings um, be, a, a, occasioned by that. So I mean, this, the, the the events and the and the writings of the of the mid seventeenth century are hugely influential in the nineteenth century, um, but they are being read in very strange ways and ways that nowadays we would say were really very um, very blinkered ways. Of course, we will have our own blinkers, and no doubt a hundred years people will say the same about us. But I think because of the rise of professional history and because of the rise of the of the techniques of interrogating the past, it's less likely. I mean, to get back to this, this fundamental question, you see, I think that historians do two things, and the, the really, really difficult, the really, really difficult bit is to combine them. The first is to understand the past in its own terms. So if we if we restrict ourselves to the 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 notion of um, intellectual history only, though you, we can broaden out from that, but I think is that's where you, I think you're interested. Um, how what and what how do people make sense of the world they lived in? What were the limits of their understanding, which which the, the whole of their culture imposed on them? So actually understanding, and that, there, that's why, you know, I think there are lots of very interesting things happening in the way in which people perceive God in the 17th century, which really need to be understood through an understanding of the of, of scientific knowledge, um, education, um, the, the role of the classics and so on. Now, so we have to reconstitute the mental world as well as the physical world of the 17th century. And that is a, that is a thing which I've probably been more fascinated to do the second thing is what is the what is the contribution of the past to the present now in a sense what we look at is is when do we apply filters that filter out the dross of the particular the dross of the past which no longer is necessary for our understanding of our present to to, to recover the residual gold of that of, of pure thought that as it were survives into another age and that is also a legitimate exercise but true history is is the is trying to combine those two in other words to 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 understand the residual gold in the but through a process of of understanding what's in the dish of the residue when you've sorted it out and it's very complicated and i and i, I spent a lot of my life trying to kind of get that in and it's one of those quicksilver things you get you have it and then it, it then it disappears again but so does does the present uh, does the present n need to interrogate the past and to um learn from the past yes is that difficult very um i mean this is something which you 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 probably be on my side of this particular argument i was listening to a podcast last night from someone who is doing a series of podcasts in America about um, uh, the Second Amendment to the American Constitution. Um, and the, the Supreme Court recently found, in the case relating to New York, that in fact, citizens did have a right 
to to wear and display weapons at all times because of a very obscure case in in, in London in 1686 based on a, on a single paragraph report in in a law report but but subsequently i mean at the very moment the supreme court which actually used the this this phrase that since this was a contested history they would choose the one they thought was that was the most most um convenient for the for the current case so they now declare that on the basis of an obscure case when some chap of course sir john knight walks into a bristol church in 1686 and says the irish are coming you know let's arm ourselves and go and and, and go and kill all the irish and he's then tried and acquitted what what the what the um the, the very bad historian who advises him in court actually had failed to realize is that before he came into the church he'd taken his sword off he'd take left his gun in the porch because that was required and in fact he'd had to come the long way around he had to come around the outskirts of bristol because the city of bristol bylaws prevented anyone from displaying a weapon in the city of bristol so he'd actually gone around the edge so Here's a case where it's, where it's possible to see how really bad um, uh, use of the past by by completely disassembling uh, the, the 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 residual gold you're looking for from its context is a disaster. I mean, people will die as a result of this misreading. You know, some some of these guys in America who go around shooting kids, you know, are going to do it because of, because of this Supreme Court ruling. So it matters. It matters that we get the history right. But I do think that whatever we do, we've got to do the first of the two things I said. We've got to understand the past in its own terms. We have to respect the integrity of the past and understand why people thought the way they did and why they didn't think other things because they couldn't think other things because they didn't have, they did they didn't have the um, the the, uh, the 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 idea. I mean, I would say this is why 1640s is is a fascinating period because things that which are literally unthinkable in 1640, like putting a king on trial for treason against his people, become possible. And that's that's a hard pro. It's not done. To people that you wake up this morning, and go, oh well, let's just abandon this. Let's abandon this. Or you know, John Milton, who's another radical figure, not a very attractive one actually, but he was he's a radical figure. You know, he was the first person really for twelve hundred years who didn't argue about the the doctrine of the Trinity that had been agreed at the Council of Nicaea. But he said, what if they got it wrong? And suddenly, you know, because everybody just assumed that, you know, the, the bishops had met um, uh, in, in in Nicaea, that the, the emperor told them to come to a conclusion, they'd come to a conclusion. And ever after that, that was that. You know, anyone who didn't believe in the Trinity, and then you could, you could argue about whether somebody's ideas, you know, were sufficiently in line with that, but nobody had previously said, until De Doctrina Christiana, nobody had said, what? If the if the bishops of the council I see it got it wrong, so there's not and you see I don't think Milton could would have said that or could have said that, but for the disintegrate when when everything you everything you've taken for granted is collapsing around you, uh, then you begin to wonder whether other things that you take for granted are, are valid or not. So that's why this is an extraordinarily radical period. Um, and unsurprisingly, quite, quite a lot of people, including, I'm afraid, in the end, Oliver Cromwell, I'm afraid, I'm not an anarchist, but, but for you, I'm afraid, I'm empathising, uh, um, uh, Oliver Cromwell, in the end, uh, feel that they've got to, uh, they've got to hold on to some, um, some forms and that strong governments have to stop chaos. Um, and the dissolution, wait, wait, you, you'll be very familiar with this argument against anarchism. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and he's a he's a baddie from your point of view in that respect. Sure, absolutely. Uh, John, you just keep saying in uh, such interesting things. I guess to get back to Cromwell. So he to get, just to repeat, and then I think we do, we ought to get some context on Cromwell. But uh, uh, he absolutely believes that God works through human agents, and that um, he that that he gives pa people. Both in the in his past 
and in his prison presence are given very similar choices and they have they have free will to follow them make the same mistakes as in the past or make better choices in the past or simply so so he looks to old testament figures quite a lot not simply as a sort of intellectual exercise but as a true belief and one of them is that it, that moses led the people of israel out of slavery in egypt through the red sea and into the desert where they spent 40 years complaining rather than following the pillar of fire which had been put set up before them until they were entered Premise land so he thought that the people of england were in, uh, under slavery they were under the slavery of kings and of bishops he liberated them god had helped call, helped him to they I mean, had made it clear had given him victory in the civil war in fact he used him as an instrument to win the victory the regicide is the red is the crossing of the red sea um and now he's in the desert and the people of England could reach the promised land in in three years, 10 years, 40 years, or not at all. They could track back to Egypt and back to slavery, which, of course, is what they did. Um, but he thought he didn't live to see that, fortunately. But uh, so if in, in that sort of context, all those who, who can understand that must be in, in authority in order to get the because because being free isn't being able to um, possess freedom, you know? You know, so he does see... Have, so, I mean, for me, a really crucial thing we might come back to, a really radical experiment, is the is the Little Parliament of 1653, sometimes known as Bare Bones Parliament. You know, there he calls together the 740 godliest men he knows, and he says, you have got to find a plan for getting people to own their call, to uh, to understand what it is to be free. Because at the moment, they've been given the context of freedom, but they don't yet understand what it is to be free. You have the responsibility of finding a way so that we can broaden out the, the, the benefits of freedom by teaching people the responsibilities of freedom, which, of course, is all about mutual respect, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so, for me, that is a, that is a, that, that's something I really want to talk to. Is a, so a Hillite view that, that I've got. A, I've got you know a certain amount of sympathy with Hill. I think Hill's Cromwell uh, biography, God's Englishman, is, an, is a wonderful biography and extremely interesting and challenging. But he he has a very streamlined, you know, more and more radical up to 1649, more and more conservative afterwards, and he doesn't really deal with 1653 at all. I mean, well, he doesn't really deal well. And I think that I think it's the things are um, again more complicated. So perhaps we should talk a bit. I mean, I, I assume some of your listeners will want to know a bit more about who the hell we're talking about. Yeah, I uh, I just have to turn it over to you and you know put you in the terrible position of you know spend ten or fifteen minutes. Like, can we get to the? Can we get to through Cromwell's life and career in ten minutes yeah, to yeah. get to the bare bones Parliament? See see what you can do, John, and beyond. So, he, so here's a man who, who was born in a very interesting you know, position because he's the younger son. Sorry, no, start again. He's the eldest son of the younger son of a knight. So his his great grandfather had been um had married into the same family as Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's great minister, the great revolutionary, I would say, of the 1530s. Um, who had dissolved the monasteries, and so the Cromwell family, who were quite poor, because of this link to the uh, to the to the other Cromwell, had inherited lots of church land, and they were big landowners in the area around Cambridge, to the north north of Cambridge. Um, uh, all their wealth came from from monastic land. They were so they were so pleased they changed their name from Williams to Cromwell. Um, so the trouble of being the uh, son of a younger son is you've not inherited the family wealth because of primogeniture. So Cromwell is not a wealthy man. I mean, he's probably in the top 5,000 in the country, but he's certainly not in the top 1,000. Um, he's got a lot of rented properties, uh, mainly belonging to the church. And he's got <clears throat> he's got six sisters all of whom have to be married and of course he's trying to maintain his social standing so they have to be well married which of course means big dowries so he get he actually goes bankrupt um in his late 20s and he has some form of nervous breakdown 
Um, he's a he's he's a um, in perhaps the one hundredth largest city in the town in the country, and he's a town councillor. So he, he's really a pretty minor figure. He has a nervous breakdown. During his nervous breakdown, he has a first-hand encounter with God, or he believes himself a first-hand encounter with God. He becomes a classic Puritan. You know, I've been saved despite my wretchedness. And he go and he goes off and he becomes a working farmer. He's a working farmer for several years, and then an uncle dies and leaves him uh, some another respectful amount of property, again belonging to the church. So he's slightly uh, up, and uh, in, in circumstances are still a bit of a mystery. He gets elected to Parliament in 1640, probably because people see him as someone whose strong religious views will be useful to them because they're looking for um, people who will vote with them in the, in the lobbies. Um, but he gets into Parliament as probably the poorest man in Parliament uh, for the city of Cambridge, which is there's a, there's a story we can't go into, it, but you know Providence may have something to do with it. Anyway, in 1642, as the country in country collapses into civil war most people are uh are suffering from the equivalent of covid you know i think i'm gonna wait upon events so i'm not feeling well enough to decide at the moment i think i'll decide in about a month's time which side to support so most people are trying to keep out and cromwell's one of those decisive people who says this is a war that needs to be fought so he raises his own troop um in his hometown of huntingdon and he goes to war and if and he uh, and he uh, one of the first things he does is to actually stop the Cambridge colleges sending all their silver up to the king to be used to finance his war. Now that is highway robbery. I mean, if the war had been, if there'd been peace, he'd have been hanged as a as a as a highway robber. But he has no doubt this is the right thing to do. He has a meteoric rise as a cavalry commander. Um, have no previous experience. Within a year, he's a colonel. Um, within two years, he's he's a lieutenant general. Um, and he starts a series of remarkable battlefield victories, driven mainly by this iron will and this, uh, and I suppose, I mean, to use this very, the word very loosely, this charismatic personality, people inspired by him. When he's there, they know they're going to win. <laughs> he conveys to them the certainty that he and they are acting with God's support. And, you know, there are pamphlets going around saying that when the royalists fire their guns, the uh, their their their, their, their um, muskets, the bullets are bent away from um, parliamentarian heads, and the, the parliamentarian bullets are steered into the bodies of the words. I mean, it's that kind of visceral belief. So by the end of the war, he's what well, he's not only um, you know a radical MP, but he's also a very senior army commander. And he's number two in the army behind someone who is a very decisive soldier, but a very indecisive politician. Thomas Fairfax. Fairfax isn't so much, I mean, he is, as it were, his heart is radical, but his head is cautious. And so he takes direction and Cromwell becomes the most powerful man in the army. And the army sees Parliament having won the war as not being willing to win the peace. The king is not negotiating seriously. Parliament is seeing, you know, destitution all around, the worst harvest of the century. Um, you know, there is, in fact, a, a, there is a, a breakdown of law and order. You know, the, the law and order is breaking down everywhere. The army is unpaid and is restless. And out of this chaos comes a sense that the only way, the only possible meaning all this suffering has, all this suffering people, the only possible meaning is that God has withdrawn his um, support from, um, from certainly from this king. And so we go through the uh, the decision by the army to force Parliament into putting the king on trial and executing him. There is an enormous amount of uncertainty about what he wanted to do afterwards. I mean, there is a huge lack of evidence. So historians, all, all, all historians believe they know the answer. They all recognise that, that this that is not something that can ever be proved. It depends on how how much weight you put on the reports of foreign ambassadors, on royalist spies. Do you trust them or not? There's no the, the, there's no letters of his at all. There's nobody talking about him. For, um, the, there are two possibilities really. One is 
that you want to replace Charles with his youngest son, who's eight years old, and you can manipulate. The other is let's go for a Commonwealth or or for um, um a or for a Commonwealth. More interesting is what order you do things in. Do you uh, do you per, do you get rid of Parliament? Have elections which are going to be um, where people have to take an oath of support for whether things happened in order to limit the franchise to those who are right thinking. Get a new Parliament to set up the trial and set up a settlement, or do you get rid of the King and then decide what to do? Um, and I've got a very clear view on on Cromwell's way through all this, but it's unfair to say more because it, it is it is impossible to work from the evidence that survives to come to any kind of firm conclusion it's best guess it's perhaps maybes might have it's all it's all subjunctives at any rate once it's done it's done and he then sets himself out to to look at some of the wreckage that's happened and some of the wreckage is that the, throughout the 1640s ireland has declared itself independent and is under pretty well co complete catholic control and he's sent to Ireland to sort that out. And he has a ruthless campaign in Ireland. It's ruthless because he because he doesn't like um, the thought of, of the Irish destabilising what he's the liberties found in England. It's also because he knows perfectly well, like any good general, that the political will to give him the kind of money he needs in order to succeed in Ireland will not last for long. There were war with war weariness and dislike of it. So he's brutal. And he has his he has his thing with the same the moral equivalence of um Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean he says the first two cities you come to surrender and I'll give you generous terms. Refuse and your lives are at my mercy. They don't surrender, so he kills in one case three thousand five hundred. Uh in my view, though again this is contested um, anyone who was in arms was put to death, except a few who were sent as indentured servants to America. Um, there were a lot of civilians killed. In my view, they were killed in hot blood as they were storming through the town. You don't bother to ask if somebody's a woman or a, a soldier in drag. You just kill anyone you can count. But for the cold blood killings, the rounding up of surrendered people and the, and the execution of them, that's all, in my view, so. Anyway, so it's a highly controversial episode. He then comes back to find that Scotland hasn't accepted the Commonwealth, and Scotland still wants to remain a monarchy, and, so, and that they're not going to agree to become an independent country. Scots hate this. But they're offered independence, and they refuse it. Um, and so, uh, but not only that, but they actually are raising an army to impose the king back on England. I mean, they do believe that Scotland isn't strong enough in the long term to stand up as an independent country against England. They need to be united. So they invade England and he defeats them comprehensively and occupies the, the lowlands of Scotland. By now, um, the politicians are hopelessly caught up in in um seeing how they can perpetuate their own power the they're doing nothing to do the program we've already discussed which is the, how do you educate people into the responsibility of liberty so since they're insisting on staying in power themselves he uses force to dissolve the parliament and then sets up this um 140 nominated people whose whose job it is to come up with a scheme that will um, allow for the mass education of people, the demystification of people, so that they can govern themselves. And it's a, <laughs> it's a naive failure. You know, 140 highly motivated um, Puritans simply can't agree. And they hand power back to him. And then, with I think, with genuine reluctance, he agrees to become head of state, but with limited powers, the sort of powers that he would have been happy to see the monarchy retain if monarchy had, had been retained. So he is he is required to govern through a council, which he doesn't have any immediate control over. Um, parliaments meet every three years. Um, he respects the, the legislative um, um, authority. And it all seems as though a good constitutional monarchy is being established. The problem is uh, that there are too many people who are trying to overthrow that regime and how do you deal with it you you bring in security measures of the kind that all modern governments are so fond of you restrict freedom in order to permit protect freedom i mean you know about that paradox yes yeah um uh, i mean what he does achieve is a very wide measure of religious freedom a good measure of religious equality but politically he's really not solving the problems of 
he wants to he's got a large measure of acquiescence but he hasn't got a large amount of consent and he dies a rather disillusioned man um that's sick and disillusioned in his last months and he dies um on the anniversary of his greatest victories which is rather rather fine um and um and then there's a long afterlife which we can possibly come back to if you want all right yeah i would i would love to come back to that we'll see how much more time we have but i just i, I want to go back to ireland briefly so my my dissertation director is you know from an irish american family and and hates cromwell with an ancestral hatred but i want to clarify the your argument is that the uh, cromwell would have seen the invasion of ireland which is now the great imperialist blot on his legacy as ensuring liberty it was the classic revolutionary violence yeah. in the name of liberty yeah. that that can can you speak to that a yeah. little bit more because that seems like a yeah. crucial well, distinction the first thing is he, he's not particularly anti-catholic i mean he the people are people are much better the catholics have a much easier time because he extends religious liberty to catholics he doesn't like priests but he but of course we all when we deal with ireland we've got to remember that in 1641 there had been a rebellion in ireland in which up to twelve thousand protestants had died so um um so there is a kind of and in order to stabilize that situation when the, the massacres of the protestants happening i mean england is in meltdown head of the civil war what do you do well you borrow money so you borrow money from the venture capitalists and the venture capitalists think mm. well in the end england always beat the irish mm. but but this might take a while mm. better have a big a very large uh you know, re return on our investment. We say, we'll give you a million pounds if you will guarantee that 25% of the land of Ireland becomes ours once you've conquered. So one of the things he has to do is to meet that pledge. And he has to meet that pledge because guess who is funding the state um, um, at the end of 1640, the same men. And they say, if you want any more credit to keep your army going, you've got to sort out Ireland. So he goes to Ireland, and part of the aim is is to is to is, is he has to deal with that problem. He, he sees the pro he, well, the first thing he does is to ally with the most Catholic people he can find, because the more Catholic you are, the less royalist you are. Because the real Catholic hardliners don't want a Protestant king in England; they'd like the King of Spain or the Duke of Lorraine or some other itinerant Catholic prince. So he can make a deal with hardline Catholics against moderate Catholics and the what's called the old English. The English have been there since the 12th century, who are a mixture of Protestants and Catholics. So he's anti-royalist more than he's anti-Catholic. Um, and although he blames the Irish clergy for m many of the deaths back in 1641, that actually is um, unjust. But th he has good reason. I mean, the, the literature he'd read would indicate that the Catholic priests had preached massacre. Um, they hadn't, but he, he had a reason to think they had. And so he says, yours is a covenant with death and hell. However, when he's talking to the um, Scottish Presbyterians uh, who are whipping up uh, the um, uh, invasion of England, he says, yours may be a covenant with death and hell. So he doesn't like clergy. He doesn't like clergy because what he believes in is the, is the personal encounter with the scriptures. So anyone who claims to have a right to interpret fa your faith is the enemy of that faith. So all clergy are suspe suspe suspicious. Presbyterian clergy, almost as bad as Catholic ones. However, there is, it isn't, it's not a good time to be a Catholic clergyman in Ireland. And uh, one exam question I once set is, did, what, did Cromwell aim to make Ireland as free of priests as it was of snakes? You know, St. Patrick had got rid of snakes and he was going to get rid of priests. On the other hand, he says, I will not impose on any man's conscience. You know, you have absolutely every right. And I'm not keen on seeing the mass, but what you do behind closed doors is up to you. So don't evangelize, don't proselytize. But if you want to get on with, with, with whatever priest you can still find, you know, that's fine. In England, Catholic priests are completely free to move around. So, uh, so Ireland is again, surprise, surprise, a more complicated story than, than in the Irish legend. Uh, it's not it's not a comfortable story for the English.
I mean, one of the things I would always say is that the, that he moderated actually some of the more extreme elements in the vindictiveness of of those English colonists who wanted to really uh, move every single every single Catholic Irishman to be moved to the four counties of the West. That he absolutely opposes that, and. Um, uh, so I think if we blame Cromwell for what happened in Ireland in the 1650s, we let the English more generally off the hook. So I want to say the English exp have a lot to answer for, but Cromwell is not the one who has most to answer for, with the exception of, of Trotter and Wexford and their mil that military necessity, I say, with the queasy morality of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I... To move on from Ireland, I mean, that's all excellent. What I'm hearing is, if I can summarize, this is uh, Cromwell betrayed the revolution for the same reason that most revolutionary leaders betray the revolution in the name of the revolution. In the name of yeah. liberty, liberty must be taken away right now. And in order to ensure the uh, the further future purchase of liberty in the long run. Does that sound right? Yes, I think some kinds of liberty can be can be preserved. I mean, because he is first and foremost a believer in religious liberty, and he wants to create a the political a, a political system that will protect freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of worship. Um, um, and so, but it, but he certainly he says he says quite early on, "I am a man not wedded and glued to forms of government." So he will try constitutional experiments, political experiments, you know, who participates in government. That's highly contingent. And, of course, he keeps on changing his mind, which is why he loses so many... Uh, he has this... Because he's this charismatic figure, so he'll say, and I'll try and be charismatic. I'll say, you are the person who's got the right answer here. Now I know how we're going to get liberty. Come and be my helpers. And then 12 months later, he says, well, that's complete shambles. <laughs> you know, you, you, oh, I've, found, I've found someone a much better idea. So politically, I mean, he is totally pragmatic, and he makes a lot of enemies as a result of that. But he, he's, uh, the, uh, in terms of personal freedom, as it is most fully enshrined in, in, in the right to build your own relationship with God and to act out that relationship with God, that he remains an absolute constant. He doesn't compromise on that, which is why his relationship with the Quakers, if we can talk to one particular group, why they're so conflicted, because he thinks that the Quaker leaders, particularly George Fox, have what he calls the root of the matter in him. I mean, he thinks he has a first-hand knowledge of God. He thinks he's got a hotline to God. But if only he would allow other people to be, to be free. But when George Fox condones people sort of standing in church, you know, shouting down preachers, when they're blocking the entrance to churches, you know, when they're organising tithe strikes, you know, God, for heaven's sake, he's thinking to himself, why can't you just be free? Why have you got to use your freedom in order to screw everybody else's lives up? So he keeps on trying to say, you've got such what you've got these, what because you above all, you know, have this free engagement with with scripture freedom of the holy spirit you know why does that make you think that that you have all the answers because i think there's a sense in which he thinks that behind religious freedom is a, uh, there's a mosaic of truth that lots of different people have got different fragments of the truth and by freeing them up you can create this mosaic which will be if you like your perfect society and it's not going to come from one strand. It's going to come from a bringing together. And how do you create a, the circumstances in which that happens? And, and there's this terrible final speech he makes uh, to Parliament in which says, why is it, he says, that we all believe in freedom, but we're always making, we're making wounds in one another's side, putting our fingers and groveling in those wounds and turning and twisting. Why are we torturing one another in the name of freedom that we all believe in? And he just cannot, cannot comprehend, really. You know, it's when, he, when he wants to readmit the Jews, the Jews are the most harmless people in the world. First of all, they're very useful, but they'll be a new source of credit. But the, the, other, the other thing about them is that they don't evangelize. I mean, they would simply, you know, be good, you know, moral people. 
And so he, he calls together, you know, lawyers and merchants and and clergymen who he thinks are going to be, you know, supportive of this. And the merchants all say, well, no, they'll, they'll eat into our profits. Um, um, and the, uh, <laughs> the the lawyers say, but hang on, they were thrown out by Edward the First. You know, you can't just, you can't reverse an ordinance of Edward the First. And, and the clergy say, well, they crucified Jesus. <laughs> and he just, he can't, he can't cope. And then, and then, and then fortunately, one lawyer says, we well, do realise that what happened in the, in the, in the 1290s was that um, Edward I statute threw all the Jews out of England who were in England at the time. He didn't throw out any future Jews. He said, what? He says, well, there's nothing to stop them coming back. They, they, what, what the law said was that all the Jews in England had to leave. So he says, all right, well, so they come back. And he says, yeah, they can come back. Um, and so he gives them, and he gives them, you see, this is really important, he gives them a synagogue, or he has them built a synagogue, and above all, he gives them a place to bury their dead. See, that's equality. That's not just saying you can assemble. He's saying what you, what you need for your religion to be to be authentic is a place to, a, a sacred place for your dead. If you want that, you can have it. Anything so long as you don't try to draw people away from what I think of as the, as the core truths of Scripture. So you know, I, I consider this radical, but but it's true that he's that he's not an anarchist. So he's not he's not a, he's he's not. And you know, what, you know, he. I mean, we don't know actually. We don't know actually. You know how hostile he is to Win Stanley. I mean, it's. It's Fairfax who is the um, you know the, the one who gets to, plays hardball. You know, with, I, I suspect he's not a fan of Win Stanley, but it, because it, but again, he, he, I mean, after it's not so Win Stanley's taking away you know other people's land; they they're just occupying common land. Now there are other people. Hang on, that's our common land too. Well, you've not done anything with it for the last you know fifty years. You know, you, you know, well, you know how it works. I mean, sure, you've talked to who. Um, uh, you've talked to um, uh, others about this, but you know I don't. I think Cromwell, Cromwell's probably rather pleased that he didn't have to. He had other things on his plate at that particular juncture. You know, he was dealing with, um, with um, you know uh, the uh, the army, the the, the, the protests in the army about going to Ireland, um, uh, which may or may not have been a leveller um, movement. I don't think. I don't personally don't think it was. And well, I think I for the levellers, he was. A, I think the army protests in, in the spring of sixty one were a disaster for the levellers, just when they were hoping that they might be able to relaunch uh, their campaign. Um, I don't think he's been a great fan. of I mean, as you know, he'd been a great champion of John Milburn earlier, the leader of the levellers in, in the early stages, and, I'd, and he'd supported him, actually helped get him out of the royalist prison. Um, but but Lilburn was was made made his, his life's work to bite the hands that fed him. You know, I mean, Lilburn is just like John Wilkes in the 18th century. You know, I mean, in, in, in po I mean, wonderful ideas, impossible to live with. Um, and um, I think he, I think he just thought, oh, you know, why can't he just, um, you know, just just, just count out? He, he, and you know, I, I've never been a fan of Lilburn as I would say the way he mistreated his wife. You know, I mean, he's, he's he, I mean, he doesn't consider her at all. He treats her as complete. I mean, even by seventeenth century standards. Um, so he's a, he's he's an obsessive character with with um, uh, just. I uh, Cromwell tried very hard on several occasions to to work with him to get him to compromise to reach agreements. And no, he would you know he'd have all or nothing. And Cromwell Cromwell at least on on political things would always compromise. So let's, you know, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but I want to try one more idea. So when you were mentioning Win Stanley, in the early Win Stanley, it seems to be precisely what I would describe as anarchist communism. I'm blanking now on the name of that last longer work where Win Stanley sort of suggests that there will be laws in the new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that sounds like yeah, Cromwell. I, 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 to to me that in order to protect and in his initial description of the digger society there are not going to be any laws and there's not going to be any authority and in his final version when stanley suggests there are going to be it's someone the, I think it's a moving from the won't need to be and said well perhaps there will need to be yes uh, yeah. I, you know 
Um, but I think they're still bottom up. I think they're still, it's still going to be, it's, I mean, their model is still, you know, the, um, um, the you know, the Anglo-Saxon world before the Norman yoke, you know, where people just got together and sorted things out. And it's yeah. that, so it's, it's, and that, that I think is, is, is consistent. It's just as I think to begin with, you know, the first group of people aren't going to argue much. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, they, they work together because they can see it's not going to be easy to persuade other people. So we've got to present a common front. But of course, as once they start disagreeing and squabbling, then you've got to, you've got to admit, oh, well, we're going to have some laws then. That still sounds like the, bare, think... like the bare bones parliament. <laughs> Let's all get together and work it out. Oh, wait, it turns out we have to well, have somebody in charge. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. But yeah, okay. Uh, but the, the, the point of the bare bones parliament is to create a national scheme. I mean, the thing about the levelers is that, of course, it was about radical decentralization. If you look at the, um, the plans, particularly in 1647 of the levelers, there would have been very little state. You know, there would have been, I mean, you would elect your own magistrates, you would do, everything would be done by juries that would be randomly selected. You know, the state would have very, the state would really only be responsible for external security and everything else. And there would be, and of course, there would be a constitution which everybody had signed up to, uh, in which the state couldn't interfere in all kinds of ways. So the state couldn't make you fight, he couldn't, he couldn't conscript you the state couldn't force you to go to it to um, any church you, you know you had to be free so there were the so, but the, the the levelers are, are, are the, in their early um earlier stages are, are much closer i think to, i mean as you know christopher hill was the first person i think uh you know to try to make this distinction between levelers and true levelers and to see the diggers as as it were an offshoot of the levelers now i'm not sure the evidence that that for that um being as it were, um, a deliberate, uh, you know, that it is an offshoot of levelism. But I think as a mindset, um, the levelers who, again, are really thinking about how you organise, I mean, their only experience really is how you organise London, you know, because you, 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 you break down London into its component parts and each of those component parts is then a little democratic, you know, republic. And you, you really can't see any, I mean, to begin with, you can't see any reason why everybody shouldn't take part. And then they say, well, what about servants? They'll just do what they're told while they're masters. Oh, well, we'll exclude servants. You know, and so you begin to get some some erosion. But essentially, it, you start by saying uh, all important decisions are made consensually by, by, by small local communities. And yes, you can write that up. So Cromwell would never buy into that. Um, but uh, he, he he doesn't suppress the levelers because uh, because their ideas are unacceptable. I mean, he'd have been perfectly happy to let them argue their case. How how impractical they are. I mean, it's because they interfere in they inter they they disrupt you know the unity of the army because the unity of the army is really important to him because it's disrupting you know God's chosen instrument. All right, that's a that's a great distinction. You know, insofar as I don't believe in anything that looks like pure anarchism, but that things can be more anarchistic, decentralization, consensus, grassroots, those are all the the hallmarks of more, more something as anarchist as opposed to more liberal democratic or something like that. And it sounds very clearly the levelers have that and and Cromwell doesn't, if I'm if I'm hearing that correctly. Yeah. I think I, I'm afraid that that's. I mean, I'm saying it's yeah. You, I'm totally empathetic to your position without sharing it, but I yeah. kind of understand where you're coming from. Oh, and yeah, I think that's. I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, I'm not invested in 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 Cromwell at all. I'm just curious as to where he said these ideas. Well, I, 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 I mean, I am invested in Cromwell. Really. I know you are. I mean, so you, I mean, you presumably know. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. I mean, ordained in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. so I'm a very odd person. But, <laughs> You see, I think for me, what matters is that he's someone who has strong faith and he's desperately trying to live that out in the in the um, in the mess of the world. And how in the mess of the world do you make that faith actual? And that he struggles with a lot of integrity to to do that. So the fact that I don't I don't share his religious particular religious values is less important than he's he's he is you know trying to live out authentically what it is to be you know have a first hand knowledge of God. And that I do find very attractive. But I, it, it does mean, I think, that I've got the best possible perspective on Cromwell and Ireland because an English Catholic is the ideal person to get a balanced <laughs> view of, 
because the 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 the, the, the Irish Catholics don't, Irish Protestants certainly don't, um, and um, and secular Englishmen don't get it to my mind either. So anyway, but it's important that, you do, that your listeners do know that I do have this, I do have this, this baggage or this this though. Most of my ideas were formed, you know, before I became a Catholic. Um, so. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think it, it's it's obvious that, that, that my ideas are determined by um, my 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 autobiography. I think they are. I see. I do think I do have a kind of mystical idea. I know it's a mystical idea or what, but I think we go to the past and we ask the past questions, and the past sulks and says, "No, we're not telling you about that." And what you have to do is you say to the past, well, what questions are you willing to answer? Mm. Oh, well, you want to know a question. And then you find, so you never, ever get the answer to questions you really want to get answered, but you do get answers to questions the past is going to tell you about. But that's, of course, a, a very kind of poshed up way of saying that we have some sources, not others. But in the end, in the end, I think we are engaged. So another metaphor I would use is that we know where we are, as it were, like radio receivers who are receiving messages from the past. And of course, whether we're made of Bakelite or stainless steel will, af will affect the quality of the sound. But basically, there is a message from the past, which we are the, you know, the imperfect um, transponders of. Um, but I do think there was a real past with which we have a real engagement. And it's, so it's not it's not all made up. I mean, there is the, 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 we are we are imperfect um, uh, interpreters of real messages from a real past that is contained in sources. And we have we have uh, for the last 150 years, really, particularly the last 100 years, developed techniques for interrogating though. And so doing the, the new edition of all Cromwell's words, you know, it's been incredible to be able to think of all the ways in which, um, you know, you can. You know, is a how authentic is a, a letter printed in a in a newspaper when we know so much about the editors' newspapers and what their own uh, views are? Why was it placed in that newspaper rather than another newspaper? And so there are these things with all kinds of incredible refinements you can get in in, in order to get an understanding of the why that letter takes the forms it did and how it came down to us in that in that in that way. Anyway, does that, does that, I hope that's given you some, it's not given you resolution, but I hope it's given you some 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 further context for for what my um, my friends have been telling you. <laughs> no, this is uh, this this has been wonderful. Um, I, I, I've already taken a little more of your time than I meant to, so all that's left to say is there anything else that you you want to add? To, I forgot to ask you about the bowels of Christ uh, because that's you know that's maybe perhaps his most famous quote at this point, and uh, yeah, people. Uh, so he, I've now revealed he says it thirteen times in his life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll just leave the battle anyway, of Christ as a mystery. I, I think, I think, I mean, there's no, there's no end to what we could say, but I think I've given you a good flavour of what I think, and um, what I hope is is a as a modern, uh, informed, uh, professionally guided uh, understanding of what the past um, tells us about him and about those times. No, I think I think so as well. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Okay, okay, all the best. All right. Bye, bye, John. <laughs>